Sedgley Community Church podcast. Follow us online or come to one of our services. We look forward to meeting you. Amen. Good evening. Okay. If you've got a Bible, please, uh, if you would turn to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5. And I just want to read a few verses from, uh, from, this, from this book, the book of Matthew. Let, let's just uh, put this in context first of all. Um, Jesus has been talking to his disciples and he's been uh, explaining to them how they should be as disciples. And uh, he sat them down and he just spoke to them. As a teacher speaks to his followers. He didn't speak to the crowd. It's called the Sermon on the Mount, but he didn't actually speak to the crowd that was around him. He just spoke to this very small group of men that had left everything to follow him. And this is the context in which these words are said. And then he talks about the very qualities of being a disciple. And then he, he starts to talk about how to apply that within everyday lives. Okay, start at verse 13. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world, A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Do not think that I came to abolish the law or the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfil. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not the smallest letter or stroke shall pass from the law until it is all accomplished. Whoever then annuls one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever keeps and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say to you that unless your righteousness surpasses that of the scribes and the Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Amen. Father, we just pray for your word. We pray, Lord, that it just illuminate us. Lord, that it will draw us closer to our Saviour, Jesus. And Lord, bring us to an understanding of how to serve you in these days that we live in. In Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, for the last couple of months now in the Bible studies, We've been looking at uh, what a disciple is. And um, we had a set of four studies and they were called the hallmarks of a disciple. The hallmarks of a disciple. And uh, we spent quite a bit of time actually looking at what a disciple is. Because uh, unless we have a, a really good understanding in a a biblical understanding uh, because many people have disciples Uh, even in modern times um, you know everybody follows Twitter and Facebook and things like this and they're you know these celebrities and you don't even have to be a celebrity really do you and people will follow they follow anything really (laughs) and um, the whole the whole thing is that they have followers people follow them You know, they follow them through their various things during the day. What food they eat, where they go, what they're doing. And they're interested and they feel as though they're part of what this person's life. And that person may not have the faintest idea who these people are. But they consider themselves to be a follower. And so this idea of a follower can get really mixed up in our minds because we can think we followed somebody 
but we don't really. It's just, a, it's just a phase or it's just something that we dip into every now and again uh, when, we, when we particularly feel like we want to do that. But being a follower in the biblical sense, from a, particularly from a first century sense, which is where Jesus was, and in the context of understanding who he was and what he did and what his disciples did, that understanding is very different from today. And uh, we looked at what a disciple was and we looked what the hallmarks were, what the characteristics were of being a disciple. And we, we learned together, really, that being a disciple, we have to be totally devoted to Jesus. Totally devoted to Jesus. That's where it starts being totally devoted to him, taking up our cross and following him. There's a cost involved from the word go. And this idea of being devoted, the disciples spent everything. This was the idea that the disciple would, f- would follow the teacher, the rabbi, if you want to call him from that time, and they would devote themselves totally. They would leave everything behind and they would give themselves completely and totally to their teacher. And that meant leaving everything. That meant giving up on everything. That meant sacrificing stuff. We looked at Elisha, didn't we? And that, uh, you know, Elijah went to Elisha and said, follow me. And he was, he was working at the time. But he had to break his responsibility, and follow his teacher. So he went and he was, he was pushing the oxen and he went and he destroyed the, the things that he was using. He broke with the past. And if we're going to be anything for Jesus, we have to break with the past. We have to go forward in him and not uh, have anything that's hanging over us. We also looked at, as a disciple, we have to understand our condition before God. Now, we read those wonderful words this morning, didn't we? Uh, That we are children of the living God. And that's very, very true. We are born again of the Spirit of God. The word says, doesn't it, that the same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead is within us. And that's very true. But we have this thing called an old nature which until we are perfected, until Jesus comes, we're constantly at war with. And uh, if you feel like you're lo- like that tonight, don't worry, because we're all in the same boat. And one of the greatest theologians of all time, of history, struggled every day by saying, the things I really want to do, I don't do. And the things I don't want to do, I just do. And I can't help it. And that was Paul. So if you feel that you're letting the Lord down every five minutes, you're in good company because we're all the same. But we have a gracious God and a loving God who just restores us. If we come to him, if we say we're sorry and forgiveness, God restores us. He promises us to restore us. You see, we need to treat sin how God treats it. We need to see sin how God sees sin. Once, once we start doing that, we then start to realise how much that offends and breaks God's heart. And we start to change because we then start to understand how God looks at us. God looks at us as something so special and redeemed. And the last thing he wants us to do is taint ourselves with this world and with sin. So we need to understand how God sees us so that God can speak into our hearts, make us more and more like Jesus, make us to the point where we can't stand sin anymore, that all we want to do is please God. And then his righteousness grows within us and makes us into into what he wants us to be. And we can only be anything for God when we are poor in spirit and broken and helpless. We will never be anything for God 
until we get to that point of being broken and helpless. We need to be gentle. We need to be peaceful. We need to have compassion for other people. And we need to thirst after everything that God has got for us so that his righteousness is found in us. We heard those wonderful verses and I commented after Shirley had spoken, those verses that Paul says. And uh, my favourite bit in the whole chapter in Philippians, to be found in him. That is the most important thing. That is my heart's desire, to be found in Jesus. Because that's what makes the difference. That's the difference. That's the thing that, that changes us, to be found in him. That was Paul's cry. And if it was good enough for Paul, then that's good enough for me. And then we finally, we, didn't we, we looked at, uh, on Thursday, we looked at those words that Jesus said in the garden. And we need to say those words and we need to mean them. Not my will. Not my will. But your will be done. Those are the words that Jesus said to his father before he went to the cross. If there's any other way, please, I'll go that way. But he said, not my will, but yours be done. And you know, until we say those words and mean them, we'll never be what God wants us to be. Not my will, but yours be done. We need to have God's character, the character of Jesus, constantly developing in our lives. And then we have to walk the walk. So there's two aspects, developing the characteristics of Jesus and then walking the walk of Jesus. And you can't have one without the other. You can't have the one without the other. You know, the walk will cost us. It will bring us into persecution. It will bring us into rejection. But it's worth the cost. Jesus did it all because it was worth it because he would look through history and he would see us worshipping our Father tonight yeah. and he would say, it was worth every yeah. single drop you, of blood. You, it was worth it all. You, Aren't you glad? Yeah. Aren't you glad that it was worth it all? Yeah. That he didn't just say, I can't really be bothered with this anymore. I've had enough. No, he went through with it. He gave everything to redeem us back to God. What a wonderful saviour we have, amen? And that's the walk that Jesus asks us to take. In fact, he doesn't ask us. He demands that we take. Jesus was quite revolutionary and he was quite direct. I was, uh, I was listening to somebody this morning and they said, he said, if you can find Jesus meek and mild in the New Testament, then please show it to him. Because Jesus meek and mild doesn't exist. The straight Jesus exists. The Jesus who's, who dealt with people and said it as it is. That's the real Jesus. And he said to us as believers and followers and disciples, if you can't take up your cross, you're not worthy of my name. If you deny me, I will deny you. These are strong words, aren't they? But it makes us realise that Jesus didn't mess about. He was straight as a die. And he did that because he had a mission. And his mission was to save the world. His mission was to redeem it back to God. And you know, he didn't say when he left, when he went to heaven, have nice services. And he didn't say, feel nice, comfortable and have a nice fuzzy feeling when you come to a meeting. He said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Do what I've done. Be me to the generation that you're in and see what I can do. And this is what Jesus is all about. You see, nothing less than this level of commitment will do. This is hard preaching, isn't it? Because 
It's hard for me because I have to apply it to myself before I can say to anybody else. And it makes me think. But Jesus was straight. So when we look at God's word, we have to be straight about it. We have to be truthful about it. Even sometimes when it hurts. Because Jesus really wants us to live this out, you know. He really wants us to live out his life. And then Matthew, when, once he's been through these Beatitudes, once he's been through uh, the understanding of being poor in spirit, of being gentle, of, of mourning over our, our frail state, of trusting and searching for God, being pure and being peaceful, he then goes on to tell us how to do it. Very, very simply, how to do it. And that's just what I want to look at for a few moments tonight. Verse 13, it says, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt has become tasteless, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. Salt's a very interesting thing, isn't it? Depending on how you use it, it can either be very good for you or very bad for you. And uh, we, we come across salt uh, practically every day in one form or another. And I was very interested when I was, uh, when I was uh, uh, considering this and I was thinking about it. So I thought, well, yeah, I see salt every day. I'll put it on my, on my food. I don't try and put too much on, despite my wife looking at me now. I try not to put too much salt on it, but I do like, I do like salt. But I thought, well, what's, what's this stuff all about? You know, where's it come from and everything? And I'm not a scientist, but I know the fundamental basic things. But I do know that it's actually, it's fundamental to our existence as human beings. Without salt, we won't last for very long. Unless we have a certain amount of salt in our bodies, we'll be very ill very quickly. It's very basic, isn't it, in our food intake and, and it's used uh, in society, in life and society, in all sorts of things, in industry and all sorts of things like that. But it's a natural thing, it's formed naturally, it's a natural preservative. And it's very distinct in its taste and in its texture. It's unique, really. I don't remember much of my chemistry days when I was at school, but I do remember that it's pretty unique. And it's very pure. It preserves things. But it does affect everything that it comes in contact with. If you drink salt water, you know about it, don't you? It's horrible. You know that you've drunk something and it tastes horrible. It could be very good for you in some ways, but it tastes horrible. So it affects everything, really, that it comes into contact with. And Jesus said that as his disciples, we are the salt of the earth. We are the salt of our society. We said this morning, didn't we, that we are children of the living God. And the world doesn't recognise that. Let's face it, the world thinks we're weird. People think we're weird because we follow God. They don't understand it. And, th and they don't understand, the world doesn't understand it because they don't have the spirit of God dwelling within them. It's not that they, there's anything wrong with them or there's anything wrong with us. It's just that, the, that we have been born again of the Spirit of God. We have the Spirit of God within us. So we are aware and understand the things of heaven and the things of God. And the world doesn't do that because they are blinded by sin. So if we are the salt of the earth, that means that we are meant to affect everything that we come into contact with. It goes with the territory. So if you, for whatever reason, have a reaction in this world, 
Don't be surprised. Because you meant to. Because Jesus did. He had a reaction from the world. And it was, some was positive, some were, was quite negative. And those that wanted to hear and those that wanted to see, did see and hear. And those that wanted to be blinkered and not want to understand, then they didn't understand. Jesus affected everybody that he contacted in one way or the other. And as followers of Jesus, we have a unique message. We have the secret of a life worth living. Amen? Are we in agreement this evening? We have the secret of a life worth living. Our lives have been totally changed because of Jesus. And so he gives us a distinct, pure destiny that comes from God alone. It doesn't come from anything that we can do. It comes from God alone. As we are born of the Spirit of God, as God works in our lives, as he creates his character within us, we become more and more distinct. We become more and more pure. Our destiny and our effectiveness to the world around us becomes more and more of an impact. This message is the cross. This message is the gospel. This is the unique message that we carry, that Jesus Christ is alive, that he saved us and that, he can, that he's restored us and that he can do that for anybody and anybody tonight in this place. He can do that. He can change your life completely. He can turn you around. He can forgive you of sin. He can put you on the right track and he can bring you into life everlasting. That's the message that we have. That's the truth that we carry. And that's the salt of Jesus. That's the salt of Jesus. We need to live out the life and the character of Jesus to all that we meet. We need to be Jesus. I've said it before and I'll say it again. We need to be that perfect reflection of who Jesus is. You see, this was, the, this was the point of being a disciple. This was the point of the three years that his disciples spent with Jesus. It wasn't because they fancied walking around the Judean hillside and, and having a sail on the boat every now and again. It was just something to do. It was so that they were with their teacher. They were with their rabbi. And everything that he did, he fed them and fed them and fed them the secrets of the kingdom of heaven. So that one day they would go out and they would be Jesus. And this was the biggest problem that the religious people had with the early church. Was that he, when they were dragged in front of the Sanhedrin, they didn't see Peter and John, they saw Jesus. And you know, this is what we've got to be. We have to be Jesus to our generation. We have to walk the walk. We have to talk the talk. We don't want to talk any rubbish or drivel. We need to speak the truth of the gospel of Jesus. That he is alive and that he can change people's lives. We need to be the healing property that salt often is. We have what heals the wounded and the brokenhearted. That's who Jesus wants to minister to. He wants to minister to those that are broken, those that have no hope. He wants to bring healing to change people's lives completely, to bring heaven into the direst of circumstances. We looked at what blessed meant. We looked at what the, this word blessed meant, particularly in light of these, these things, the blessed, the beatitudes. What did it mean? And it wasn't that everything's happy, everything's rosy in the garden. But what it does mean is that in the worst circumstances that we can ever find ourselves in, we are contented and we are satisfied because we know that God is with us. That's being blessed. 
That's the reality of being blessed. And this is the reality that we carry and we have to bring into the lives of people that are around us so that their lives become blessed. And so their lives are changed, are turned around. This is what it means to be the salt of the earth. This is how we do it. You see, when we looked at these beatitudes, when we looked at these characteristics, we realised that this was just a start. We, we said, didn't we, that to be, um, to be broken in, in spirit, to be poor in spirit, was the absolute foundation stone. And everything else builds on top of that. But we, we must live this out. We must reveal Jesus to other people. You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. It's interesting, you know, uh, um, to know where, where this takes place. There is a place that you can go to in, around the Sea of Galilee called um, the Mount of the Beatitudes. And there's a, a church there. Well, there's a church on every hill, it seems, somewhere in Israel. And there's a place there where you can go. And it's a beautiful place, actually, that looks over the, the Sea of Galilee. And all of that area is very beautiful. It's very beautiful, but it is very hilly. There's lots of different hills and mountains around that area. And there is a city in northern Galilee uh, in Israel, and it's called Safed. It's right up the north. And uh, most commentators believe that um, this was the place that Jesus was referring to because it's right on top of a hill. And there's not many, t uh, many uh, towns that are actually on top of hills. But this is right on the top of the hill. And it's a city of lights. It's, uh, it's a very interesting place uh, for certain reasons these days. <clears throat> but it's, common, it's commonly thought that this was the place that Jesus was referring to because you could see it for miles and miles and miles around. And uh, night time around the Sea of Galilee and the Galilee area is beautiful because you can see uh, little pockets of villages and towns and cities. You can see lots and lots of lights at night. It's beautiful and it's, qu it's warm and it's quiet and it's a lovely part of the world. And you can almost hear the words of Jesus as he talks about these these things and I mean you can do the same here can't you you can go you're pretty we're pretty high up here you can go out and you can see for miles you can see the lights and uh, I sometimes think of this these words of Jesus when I when I when I see that you know that we are to be a light we really live in a desperately dark world don't we you don't have to switch the news on for very long to realise that this, this world is going darker and darker and darker. And our nation is going darker and darker. And, we, and the reality is that we live in a world that prefers darkness to light. And Jesus talks, uh, I'm sorry, John talks about Jesus, doesn't he, being the light of the world being the light that all of humanity needs to see. And Jesus said himself about being the, the light and the importance of the light in our lives as believers. He starts with a very famous verse in John's Gospel. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, 
but have eternal life. But then he goes on to say, but God did not send the Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through him. He who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already because he has not believed in the name of the whole only begotten Son of God. This is the judgment, that the light has come into the world and men love the darkness rather than the light, for their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But he who practices the truth comes to the light so that his deeds may be manifested as having been wrought in God. It's the light of God, isn't it, that makes the difference. It's God's light shining within us and shining out through us that makes the difference. This message that we carry is a message of light in a dark world. And it's, as it's a message of light, we are the people of light. Okay? As his disciples, we are the people of light. And Peter explains this in his letter in 1 Peter 2 verse 9. You are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvellous light. He has called you out of the darkness. So why do we stay in it? If God has called us out of that, why do we let it contaminate us as believers? Don't be conformed to this world. That's what Paul says in Romans. Don't let the things of this world contaminate you and take away the, the precious light of the gospel and the, and the impact of that within our lives. We have been called into the light of God and we are to shine that light to all that we meet. And Jesus tells us here, isn't it, that the light is seen through living out his character. The light is seen through living out his character and demonstrating it through our good works. And James echoed Jesus' words when he said in his, his letter, in James chapter 2, What use is it, my brethren, if someone says he has faith but he has no works? Can that faith save him? If a brother or sister is without clothing and in need of daily food and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warmed and be filled and yet, do not do, um, and yet you do not give them what is necessary for their body, what use is that? Even so faith, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. You see, this is, this is going back to the Beatitudes, isn't it? This is going back. that we are to comfort those that mourn, that we are to be gentle in our relationships with each other. We have to start here first and also the people that we meet, that we are to be merciful to people, that we are to show the purity of the gospel in the lives of people, that we're to be peacemakers, that we're to help people when they're going through the difficulties and the persecutions and the problems of life. This is what James is talking about. And this comes out of a good relationship and a right relationship with God. It has to start with that relationship first. And then the good works that we do are a fruit of that. It's a fruit of the gospel. We need to be like Jesus. This is what Jesus did. I made reference to Pastor Steve's message last Sunday morning where, uh, where Jesus did the unthinkable and interrupted the, the funeral. 
But the one thing that he did do, which, which people just didn't understand, was that he touched the dead body and made himself unclean, ritually unclean in the sight. He put God's grace into action. This is Jesus. This is, the, this is the standard that we have to live to. This is what we are to be, to be followers of Jesus. Because God's light is coming. Amen? God's light is coming. You believe me this, this evening? God's light is coming. Jesus is coming. And we have an obligation to present Jesus. We need to burn and burn and burn and burn the light of Jesus into this world and into the people that we meet. Because we are a reflection of Jesus. And we do this, don't we, as we stand on God's word. As we demonstrate the righteousness that we have in Christ. These, these are the following wor words that Jesus said. His word would not pass away. God's word would not pass away. But everything would stand upon God's word. And that we have to be righteous in what we do. We have to show righteousness. This is the standard we have to live by. This is the foundation of being the salt of the earth and being a light in a very dark world. You know, Steve said it enough times and Shirley has as well and I reiterate that. We, we are a church of no compromise. We will preach the gospel. We will preach the word of God. And we need to be a people of no compromise as well. We need to stand on God's word. We need to preach it. We need to share it. We need to live it. And then God will do something. He asks us in faith to step out and to take our place. To take our place at the mark. This is the time. We are entering into a new day. And God is doing a new thing. But he's asking us to take that step forward. To take our step up to the mark and proclaim Jesus as we've never proclaimed him before in this church. The Lordship of Jesus Christ over Sedgley. The Lordship of Jesus Christ over Gornal. That's what God has called us to. And that's what he wants us to step up to now. It's our day to do that. It's the responsibility of us because nobody else will do it. It's the gospel. We have to proclaim the gospel in these days. Jesus is returning soon. This world is going, turning to complete rubbish, isn't it? Yeah. I don't have the words. Yeah. We have the hope of Jesus we do. to this world. Let's be that reflection of Jesus. That's the core of every disciple. To be like Jesus. The author and the finisher of our faith. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. 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 Bless you, Jesus. I don't ask us to do this very often, but if you want to stand for Jesus tonight, then do that. If you, want, if you want to say, I want to put this compromise to one side, I've got to step up to the mark now. These are the days when I need to stand with Jesus. Amen. If you want to do that, just do it very quickly now. Hallelujah. Stand with me. This Jesus. is the time for us, folks. Yes. This is a time to raise the standard Amen. that Jesus Christ is King of Kings, Lord of Lords. 
over this town and over this region. And the powers of evil and the devil will not win because we will be ready to be used by God in every situation that we find ourselves. Hallelujah. 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 Let's, let's praise him, folks. Hallelujah. We glorify you, Lord. Hallelujah. 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 Bless your name, Lord. Hallelujah. 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 Lord, we come to you tonight. We commit ourselves to you. Lord, you challenged us. You want us to be a true disciple. A disciple that's broken. A disciple that loves. A disciple that mourns over our sinful state. A disciple that is that thirsts after righteousness, that wants to be gentle and peaceful and impart your love and mercy into the lives of people. Heavenly Father, hear our cry, we pray. Change us, Lord Jesus. Forgive us of our sin and bring us close to you. Lord, help us, Lord, to put the things of this world to one side. And Lord, let us follow you as you called your disciples, let us hear those words, follow me. Lord, we will. Not our will, but yours be done, we pray. Amen. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Amen.